um, with that, Gary, do you feel like you'd like to get started? Sure. All right. I will, um, uh, I will begin the spiel uh, mm -hmm. because it's my turn to do the spiel. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, my name, uh, welcome to session three of the Emerald Coral Academy. I'm Scott Kovacs. I'm the executive director of the Emerald Ensemble. We're a professional choir based in Seattle, Washington. The Emerald Choral Academy is a series of interactive webinars during which our area's leading choral professional singers reveal their personal tricks of the trade to the community uh, of singers. These webinars will then be made available freely to singers across the world via the internet, most specifically YouTube at this present time. The Emerald Ensemble is very grateful to our generous donors who have made this project possible, particularly the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. We encourage anyone participating or viewing this webinar to make a donation as you are able at emeraldensemble.org. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our mailing list to hear about future sessions of the Academy and other activities of the Emerald Ensemble. I will post links to our donation page and to our YouTube channel in the chat in just a few minutes. This webinar is being recorded. By participating, you are granting the Emerald Ensemble permission to share your contribution please ensure that your microphones and cameras are turned off for the duration of the presentation. You can ask questions to the presenter by typing into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll pause periodically to field, to field questions. There will be a designated Q&A period at the end of the presentation as well. As we all know by now, technology can be a fickle thing. Please bear with us if we experience technical difficulties during the presentation. Uh, yesterday, actually I think it was two days ago, you would have received a confirmation email that included a PDF workbook handout. Uh, you would probably want to access that now along with two sharp pencils. Uh, there is also a link to the handout. Uh, I will also put a link to the handout in the chat window in just a second. This session's instructor is the Emerald Ensemble's artistic director, Dr. Gary D. Cannon. Gary is one of the most active conductor slash musicologists in our area. In addition to the Emerald Ensemble, Gary leads the Vashon Island Chorale and the Cascadian Chorale. You've probably read his program notes, which are included in uh, programs of many prominent Seattle in musical institutions, including Choral Arts Northwest and the Seattle Symphony, where you've probably caught one of his pre-concert lectures. He's also a pretty fine tenor and has sung professionally throughout the Pacific Northwest. His topic today is practical score markings. It's a pleasure to introduce to you my very, very, very dear friend and colleague, Dr. Gary Cannon. Gary? That's me, guilty as charged. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. I'm going to go right away to the, the sharing of the screen. Uh, and let's find out if this goes right, everyone, y'all. How does that look? All right, Scott, does that look like a presentation? I think that's what it's supposed to look like. Oh, hooray, hooray, hooray. Uh, technology is working. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm Gary Cannon. I'm actually very excited to uh, talk to you today about score markings because it's something that I think uh, one tends to assume that all singers do and they all know how to do this or that they'll figure out a system on their own. Uh, I don't think it's safe to assume anything, however, in the world of music. Uh, so I hope to present to you a few suggestions, some of them specific, some of them general, uh, so that you can devise your own system of markings, things that will work best for you. There will be quite a lot of uh, music samples uh, there. If you received the handouts a couple days ago, you'll have scores to the four pieces that I've drawn from for these samples. Uh, even if you don't, however, you'll still be able to see everything. You may want to take notes on that, that blank sheet paper. I tend to go pretty quickly through some things, uh, knowing that much of this will be familiar to many, but not necessarily to all. So my hope is that, that, that each of you will find a little something uh, to get out of this. Uh, so we start with the basics. Uh, the key element of score markings is that the score is a working paper. It's not a holy relic. It's okay for you to write on it. It's okay for you to write a lot on it. You will not receive a prize if you have the cleanest score at the end of the performance. Uh, and if some people have a lot of ego built into the fact that if their score is unmarked and they're still singing well, that, that there's, there's something that they get from that. I think that's ridiculous. And I encourage you to share that opinion. Uh, 
the main reason uh, that I encourage score markings is that none of us has a perfect memory. Uh, it's an aspect of being reliant on yourself, write down what you need, so that any time the conductor says something in rehearsal, you just instinctively write it down. And even if the conductor hasn't said it yet, and you think they're going to, write it down. What this does is it allows the conductor more time to work with other singers who might not be doing this technique uh, or who may need more effort so that eventually your choir can spend more time on things like phrasing, tuning, text, meaning of the text, uh, and the, the real reasons why uh, you got involved in music in the first place. That said, be sure to ask your choir's librarian before you make any permanent markings, such as hole punching or highlighting or using a colored pencil. Colored pencils are very difficult to erase effectively. It's possible your score may have been borrowed from the publisher and they need to be returned in a clean condition. So you have to be careful about that. Um, some choirs are also very particular about how much markings they like to have in their scores, um, but that's, that's up to your choir specifically. So there are, I think, four keys to a truly great score marking, just one individual marking. Not all markings have all four, but as many of them as you can fit into a marking, the better off that marking will serve as a score marking. The first is the location. The actual staff where you're reading all the notes is so crowded of information that it's best to write above it or below it. It may seem kind of lo you know, simple logic, but I, I often realize that I'm missing markings like dynamics because I've written them in among all that other stuff. Also, there's a lot of information there. The staff is compact and full. So write something bigger, bigger than your note head or bigger than is needed. And I'll say that'll be a recurring theme for the, this while. Also, uh, best to involve shapes. The staff itself has so many horizontal lines and vertical lines. The staff itself is horizontal. You have bar lines that are vertical and stems. Uh, so instead, use shapes that your eye will immediately be drawn to. Slashes, circles, curves, angles, designs. Uh, be imaginative. And finally, it's better to use symbols than full words or even letters if you can get away with it. Uh, our brains are such that we register symbols much, uh, very quickly, and it helps to separate that from trying to interpret an entire, entire word, especially while you're singing. Location, size, shapes, symbols, four keys. Let's move in, let's go right to it. <coughs> Rhythm, all this talking, I'm already gonna take a cough drop. I promise I'm not sick. Rhythm, to count the rhythm. So this is an excerpt from Victoria's Omanu Mysterium. Uh, the four pieces we'll be looking at, bits and pieces of, you may have sung uh, many of them. They're somewhat standard repertory. We're looking specifically at the soprano line and in that third and fourth bar, it has some tricky stuff. Now you as a singer might not actually struggle with that, uh, this section, but the score markings that, that I'll go through can be applied anywhere. Uh, so there are a couple of different ways you can go about uh, notating something to help you with the counting. The, the, the predominant one, the one I recommend, is making marking the beats above the staff. So a large beat for the, a large slash for the beat, smaller slashes for a subdivision or for smaller beats. Uh, some prefer instead to actually write numbers, the number of the beat, one and two and one and two and, or even one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Whatever system works for you. Uh, again, I, I find that symbols work the best, so the slashes work well, even though they're vertical lines. Uh, the fact that they're above the staff uh, helps to draw them apart. Now, if you just need a reminder to, for example, sustain a note, like in this case, we have that tied A over the bar line, just something like an arrow will suffice. I tend to write arrows like that below the staff rather than above, though it does depend on, on uh, where the, the note is. If the note is higher in the staff, you might write the arrow above. I find the idea of sustaining is very linked to the breath, and the text is linked to the breath as well, for me personally as a singer. So by writing it below, I'm, I'm connecting the sustaining with the philosophy, with the idea of breathing. Uh, now, part of counting uh, specifically is dealing with cutoffs at the end of phrases. Here's a bit from Randall Thompson's Alleluia. It's that second and third bar, the Lu Ya, making sure that you're off on beat two, not earlier or later. 
Now the conductor will help in this particular case because there's a rallentando and everyone is cutting off there. Uh, but again, it's the, the, the philosophy or the style of using it that you can transfer to other uh, pieces of music. There are two methods I, I would encourage you uh, toward in, as regards cutoffs. One is to use various lines, arrows, and arcs. This can be uh, together with the rhythm lines that we talked about in the previous slide. That's those slashes above. My favorite is a strong horizontal line at the end of the syllable um, or, uh, that concludes or ends with a little vertical line. The position of that vertical line is crucial. I put it under the rest, not under the note or in the middle of where the note is. Again, it's that psychological uh, symbol that you keep going all the way and then you stop. You know exactly how the stopping works. Some people prefer to use an arrow instead. That's also fine. Some people prefer to write a, a kind of slur-like line above the staff, which may or may not conclude with an actual arrow point moving to the rest. That's of course optional. Lines, arrows, arcs above, below the staff and somewhat bigger than what you're normally looking at too. So I said there's a second method. Here is that same uh, sample from uh, the same example from the Randall Thompson Alleluia. You can accentuate that rest on beat two. There are a couple ways of doing that. One is reinforcing the beat number. Just write the two above the rest. You, know, you can even go so far as to circling the number and the rest together. That's very eye popping. It's a very effective way to reinforce when, where, when your cutoff is. You can also, instead of reinforcing the beat number, reinforce a final consonant if there is one. Now, of course, the word Alleluia doesn't close with that N that I've written here, but if it did, you could write the letter underneath the rest, as if to say, the rest is when this consonant happens. You can even put a little arrow, as I've done there, uh, that links them, or you can circle the rest together with the consonant. Any of these variables um, will work. Play around with what works for you, perhaps. Now cutoffs have a, a special uh, aspect as well in what, what some people call an English style of cutoff. Uh, how these should be handled is up to your conductor. There are still some questions about what composers really wanted in this case. Uh, but let's assume your conductor wants you to cut off on the tied eighth note. In this case, Vaughn Williams has written that for the second statement of the word sun there as it ties over uh, to that eighth note A. I suggest you just chop it off one big slash as if to say that note does not belong here. It's irrelevant. You can even cross out the note to be really obnoxious or you can again place the continent, uh, consonant underneath that tight note. That's after all uh, the theory behind why, uh, why that tied eighth note would uh, existed anyway. On the other hand, if your conductor wants you to sustain to the printed rest, just use the cutoff methods that we already talked about, the, the lines underneath or the arrows to show go all the way to the rest. So that's, that's all I'm going to say about rhythm, that aspect of time. As for another aspect of time, we have tempo. Often you have little sudden changes like this. Here in Randall Thompson's Alleluia, the movendo is written above the soprano line, but of course it does apply to all of the other parts as well. Uh, so make it big, write the word faster, put a huge circle. I'm not just talking about one little single line circle, go over and over and over so your eye will be drawn to it. If you're not comfortable with the Italian or whatever language is written there, go ahead, translate it. You'll be teaching yourself the language as it progresses as well. <clears throat> If I were a base in this particular situation, I would definitely write the indication above my, uh, uh, above my own part. Notice also that I've written that word fast before it actually needs to happen. Uh, that's another special key, right? Before you need it. And then there's this symbol. This symbol is so charming. I resisted it for decades and then I tried it and, and fell in love. This little uh, drawing of eyeglasses, which to me always seems to look more like a bicycle, at least the way I draw, um, just as a symbol to watch the conductor. I used to write watch whenever I needed that, or three exclamation points. But I tell you, that, those little eyeglasses have um, rendered that uh, so much quicker. I, I see it so much more quickly than, than those other markings. 
So these are way to deal with sudden changes of tempo. Uh, when there are gradual changes, uh, there are other things. So here are, is a continuation of that same Randall Thompson Alleluia section. This is what you're seeing here is five systems of just the soprano line. Two systems on a page. So two and a half pages worth of soprano part. It's kind of like what an, an orchestral instrumentalist would see anyway. In these 18 bars, there are eight tempo changes. Ovendo, Stringendo, Rao, Largamente, and so on and so forth. So here's a great chance to really explore different ways of marking uh, tempo changes. These are the three basic symbols that, that I find work well. Uh, an arrow to forward, an arrow to the right to speed up, a squiggle to slow down, and glasses to watch. So let's compare that first system. Uh, eyeglasses before the movendo, because you're going to have to watch your conductor at that point. Then an arrow forward as that movendo, which means moving, will, the tempo will keep moving forward. The next system, I'd write those arrows over and over as constant reminders that I still have to keep moving. And even more eyeglasses, still watching. Now the next system gets fun. You're still going faster, and then I have that squiggle there, the rallentando, <laughs> to indicate the, the big slow that happens there. And when you get to that largamente, slowly indication, another big piece of eyeglasses. Uh, the other two systems have some other uses there of eyeglasses and the squiggles, but uh, those have, have great usages. I do recommend squiggles as opposed to backward arrows, arrows pointing to the left, as uh, some people write. Uh, I find that those two arrows then are just too similar for the brain to register very, very quickly. But the squiggle really nicely implies to hold back, put the, put, put the brakes on it. Those are two aspects of time so far, rhythm and tempo. Next is meter. Uh, the editor of this score, of Victoria's Omanu Mysterium, uh, did it just right. That's because the editor was me. Um, and that is the following. Above the staff, you can write the old unit, an equal sign, and then the new unit. Generally, you'll want those to be, the, the, generally it'll be the unit that the conductor is conducting, but not necessarily all times. And it's crucial to, play, crucial to place that equal sign right above the bar line itself. Uh, there are actually two different methods of notating meter changes like this, uh, unequal meter changes, uh, and uh, they contradict each other and there's all kinds of the, the, that have been going on for, for literally centuries uh, or over a century anyway. Um, but this is the way that is foolproof. You will see where the old unit belongs, you'll see an equal sign, and now you'll see where the new unit belongs. So that it's foolproof, I tell you, foolproof! One of the most important things when you're doing score markings is, as regards meter is mixed meters like in this section from the Vaughan Williams. Uh, Thus we were heirs to endless woes, till God the Lord did interpose. Those two five eight bars. Uh, some people like to write those slashes over every beat so it's all nice and clear to them. I find that can be a bit visually cumbersome. So here's another method. And that's just to put a horizontal bracket above the groups of three, because that, those are the weird bits. That's what you have to draw your attention to. The duples you'll find fine, get fine. Thus we were one, two, three, endless woes, till God the one, two, three, interpose. And it'll just flow right naturally. Those above brackets can be very helpful too for things like hemiolas. Uh, do, 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 um, I won't go over that, but if you can write the three brackets above how the larger meter uh, works in a hemiola, it, it's especially helpful when you have music in 7-8 that might be a 2 plus 2 plus 3 and then a 2 plus 3 plus 2 or some combination. This way you can just right away see where the 3 is and be done with it. Uh, so uh, here is a rough review of what I've talked about so far, these aspects of time, that is rhythm, tempo, and meter. Uh, yeah, this is the longest of the sections, by the way, that, that you'll have to sit through uh, my talking. Uh, Scott, are there any questions or other suggestions of uh, things that other people use for these, uh, for the, the ideas of time? 
Not so far. Um, uh, it, it seems to be pretty thorough, so fo folks don't have too many questions. The only request is that we slow the pace down just a little bit. I think people are taking a lot of notes as they go tonight, so um, let's give them plenty of time to, um, uh, uh, to write as they go. Anyone else questions for Gary so far? All right, everybody, wiggle a little bit. Do <laughs> shoulder rolls. Time for shoulder rolls, everybody. I don't know how many of you have been sitting in Zoom meetings all day today, but do uh, do shoulder rolls opposite, do shoulder rolls other opposite, and then gentle head, head roll, getting the chin down as close to the sternum as possible, and do one surprise breath. <gasps> And Gary, let's, um, oh, okay, uh, Gary, oh, uh, Joyce is asking um, uh, to send a copy of the time page. We will um, presumably make the slide deck available online um, for you, Joyce, so that you can get to all of those markings. Um, I'm having trouble listening and, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer that one separately. Gary, I think we're ready to go on to the next, uh, oh wait! Here's one from here's one from Kathleen. Can you give another example of a meter change, uh, i.e., quarter to whole note or dot or similar? Sure. Let me let me back up to that page so that the principle uh, would still apply. Uh, so, if for example the like the old quarter note becomes the new half note, uh, if say you were in in two four and go to two two or or three two. Uh, in that case, the same principle uh, can apply. So I would uh, make sure that the old unit, which would be the quarter note, is written above the end of the old section, the old tempo section. That equal sign is positioned above that bar line. Um, and then the new unit is positioned at the beginning of the new, temp uh, the new meter section. Uh, it can get tricky uh, when there are page turns as well. Uh, then I, I do that, I write that symbol at the end of the page so that when you turn the page, you already know uh, what, what's coming. Um, so yeah, those units are all in, uh, interchangeable. Now as to how the meter change might behave, that'll be different for every piece. But as for how to mark the score, this, this system, uh, so far at least for me, has worked for, for any uh, changes that, that I've needed. I use it when, in conducting scores as well. Kathleen, did that answer it for you? It's a great question. Yeah, it is. We're good. Okay. We're good. All right, Gary, are we gonna I'll, move on? I'll proceed ahead. Uh, and right, ironically, the, 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 uh, it's ironic that the section on time is what uh, needed to slow down, right? <laughs> uh, this next bit uh, is, is inherently slow too. Uh, and that is, we get to talk about the, what is burning on everybody's mind, I suspect, and that is pitch. How do you find your starting pitch? And how do you notate that? There are four simple steps, and these steps all will be applied to other markings uh, later uh, through this presentation. First is to find your source pitch, what you're, what you're stealing from, if you will. Circle that source pitch. Then circle your pitch, the start of what, what you need to sing. And then finally connect them with an arc or a line. <clears throat> Uh, here are a couple of examples from the Von Williams Fantasia on Christmas carols. So in this particular moment, the altos will need to find that C. There are a few different ways they can do that. I've written three here. Uh, there are other options as well. And if, if, you, if you are that alto, you may not need all three of these. One method is to listen to the baritone soloist who sings that C on the downbeat of the measure but it's pretty fleeting. It goes by pretty quickly, so that might not be sufficient. Another way is to listen to the strings in the orchestra. The uppermost instrument uh, will have that C and to steal it from, from them. Notice how big that arc is and how the arc has to go all the way to the alto line so that they can, uh, uh, you know, so that it will catch the eye and the eye will be drawn to that orchestral part below. 
Uh, however, those strings are marked double piano, and in the particular concert halls, you may have difficulty hearing that pitch. So here's a third method, and that is to listen to the basses and tenors. I know it's such a pain to have to listen to basses and tenors. I know because I am a tenor and I don't like listening to them, but I digress. Don't put that part on YouTube. Um, so the basses come in, the tenors then lead directly to that pitch, that same C that the altos have to sing. Uh, for In this case, I often use a bracket rather than this circle, circle, connect method. Um, uh, and that works well to show a horizontal, a vertical relationship. So that's for the altos there. The basses have a different special uh, circumstances. If they're lucky enough, they can hear the cellos come in one beat before them, uh, which is very nice of Vaughn Williams to put that cello line there. On the other hand, uh, the, again, the cello is a double piano. It might be hard to hear them. So fortunately, the baritone soloist has sung their starting E just one and a half bars before they need to sing it. But as far as the score layout goes, that pitch is on the whole system above. But the same principle can apply. You can circle that old, the, 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 the source pitch, draw a big arc, in this case one that implies you're going to go down further to the bass line, and then connect that at the beginning of your system, not really connect it, but uh, virtually continue that to, uh, uh, to connect to the pitch that you need to sing. So the basses need to really have their thinking caps on at this particular moment. I have faith in them. Uh, very heartily. But this notion of circling a source pitch, circling your pitch, and connecting them, it, it's, 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 it comes back in, uh, quite a bit. Uh, what, why is this page here? Oh, right, this one. Uh, sometimes uh, an issue with finding your pitch will have to do with when you're turning pages. Uh, this section, sorry, it's not as clear as, as I, I'd like it to be, is from the Randall Thompson Alleluia. You're seeing both the soprano and the alto parts, and this is the end of a page. Uh, so the question then is, how will the sopranos find their G sharp that they have to sing at the beginning of the next page? This is a wonderful invention. Uh, medieval music scribes came up with it. It's called the Custos. Custos. It's a real word. Uh, you can even use it in Scrabble, I suspect. And this is a little symbol that is a hint of your starting your pitch on the next page or the next system. And I wrote one a little there. I have an arrow pointing toward it, uh, that miniature G sharp. I didn't use a stem. It's just the note head. Even if it's a half note on the next page, I'd still write it with a filled in note head to kind of show this is just a symbol, it's just a sign, and it makes it easier to see if, it is a, if it's filled in as a note head. Uh, if you want, if the Sopranos uh, had difficulty finding that G sharp, they could even do that same trick that I just did on starting pitches. Circle the alto's G sharp right before theirs and connect it to the, to the custos. In this case, the soprano would be watching the, or singing along their own line, and visually, the eye will be drawn to that line, that diagonal line, and the circle on the alto note. So they'll be rem they'll remember. Oh, I have to think about this alto note while I'm singing my own notes. The custos, it is your friend. Use it liberally. It will it will appreciate it. Now, if you just have a difficult pitch, you just are struggling with it. Uh, or you're sight reading something and you're, you're not getting a particular pitch and you want to work on it at home, uh, it's always a great idea to rehearse at home, I think, then this is what to do. I write a gigantic slash underneath it. It is a slash that is obnoxious. It goes through one or two staves below it. It's the kind of slash you just write and you get frustrated, you can't sing the notes, so you just slash right underneath it. Uh, this means you'll be able to find it very quickly when you look through the score at home. No more of this, which pitch was it that I'm needing to work on. You can go a further step and work with me here. You can dog ear the corner of the page. Remember, the music score is not a holy relic. You can undog ear it later. It won't mind, I promise. Now, 
uh, there may be things, you may know what your difficulty is with the note. In that case, you can do something like this. If I'm an alto here, and I know that I tend to overshoot that A and sing a G instead, then I can write a small little arrow as a reminder, a reminder to say, make this note higher than what, you're, what you in, instinctively want to do. Uh, that solves uh, many problems uh, for me at least, especially if, if uh, I sing, sing a fourth rather than a fifth or the other way around. Um, it, it's a great way to get a brief reminder. Now, if you've had some music theory training, you can go so far as to write the intervals in. Uh, the lowercase m for minor, capital M for major, capital P for perfect. Uh, Kathy, I think, had asked early on in the, in the chat if I ever use uh, capital letters as abbreviations. Well, here's at least one case, but so far there haven't been many letters uh, either. Uh, a couple of oddities I'd suggest, though. One is using the equal sign for a unison, and one is using the letters TT for tritone rather than identifying it as an augmented fourth or a diminished fifth. Uh, just saying tri the word tritone brings up such a clear image of that interval uh, that I find that, that it works very, very well. Sometimes the intervals uh, that you may be struggling with are on the smaller side. So here is a special shorthand for half steps and whole steps. In this sample from the Victoria Oman New Mysterium, the altos have this half step from E to F natural. Um, and I use that little caret to indicate a half step. If they're short, it shows that it's short. And I even angle that half step, uh, that, that indicator a little bit so that it looks like it's going upward. I always write it above the staff and, uh, and not next to the notes. You can make exceptions, of course, of how, however it works for, for you. If it were a whole step there, I'd write a kind of small bracket instead of that, that caret. And again, it can be at an angle. Um, these are these symbols for half step and whole step I first learned when I was learning music theory in college. Uh, and and, um, and I, I'm surprised that I haven't seen other folks uh, use them actually, but they're, they're very, very helpful. Now, if you have the same pitch, say over two or three or five bars and you have a hard time remembering the second one, then use the same method that we talked about with the starting pitch. Circle the source pitch, circle the destination pitch, the one you want help with, and connect them with that kind of an arc. Um, again, I'm not saying that altos would be struggling with finding that E after the first E, but this is a nice clear way to demonstrate the, the technique. Notice again we're using symbols and we're using unusual shapes, so the eye is drawn to it, even though in this case it has to be on the staff. <coughs> Here's something a little more elaborate but extraordinarily helpful as regard pitch. Sometimes music will have what's called imitative entr entrances. I'm not going to go into all of the, 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 um, the Renaissance theory behind that. Uh, to look at this staff, it looks like just a whole bunch of notes. I should point out here that um, the first two bars are the end of a system, and then after that from bar 29 is the next system. I put them next to each other just so you can see how, it, how the music functions together. Uh, that's why there's that break in the middle. So these imitative instruments, uh, it looks like a jumble, but you can identify when one part imitates another. So in this case, the basses and the tenors have the same rising motive. Basses is a fourth, tenors is a fifth, then the sopranos and altos take that, and then the basses and tenors again. By writing these curved lines, your eye will be drawn to the other parts. So in this case, if I were a soprano, say, at bar, 20, at bar 30, and I had all these slash marks, I would be, uh, my ear would be paying attention to the basses and then I'd be able to know what the basis pitches were so that I can replicate them uh, on my own when it got to be my turn. Uh, this is also a helpful way uh, for the basses alone uh, on their second entrance uh, to know what their reference point was earlier. Now, in this case, they have a different starting pitch, but even just identifying the similar elements will help them to uh, be aware of what's different. Sometimes, too, instead of uh, an arc like that, a little curved line, you can use uh, uh, an angle. Uh, often with the angle, 
um, permeating the top line of the staff. This works, um, I find, especially well if you have two imitative elements going on at the same time. Uh, Brahms does this a lot, Bach too, of course. Um, so the primary one, you could put that slash, and then the secondary motive can have this little angle. Uh, and seeing that interplay is actually really cool to look at in a score. I recognize this is kind of tricky. It involves a more advanced score study, but it's something that perhaps your conductor will point out during rehearsals uh, as, as the structure of the piece and that, uh, that you can put into your score as a marking uh, and that will be, will be surprisingly helpful. So those are polyphonic imitative entrances. What about homophonic entrances? So, so to look at these three bars, if you're just singing along your bar, you're not gonna notice anything unusual about the change in texture. That said, there is a change in texture. Suddenly, everybody sings et admirabile together at the end of that second bar. So I suggest writing this one big bracket that links everybody. Uh, or if not quite everybody is singing it, then leave a gap in that bracket. That's fine. Again, adapt these, these methods however, however work for you, however they work for you. Um, this, uh, yeah, big bracket. And it, oh, that's what it was. Also draws your attention effectively to uh, the other parts. It helps you be aware of what your, your comrades are singing and therefore it helps tuning. Isn't tuning the bugaboo of all? And this is the kind of thing that you might not think it, but it does help tuning. Here's another uh, a couple of ideas as regards tuning. This sample from the Victoria O Monument Mysterium has a tenor line that is notorious, uh, notoriously difficult to keep in tune. I know because I've conducted it and sung it both in tune and out in both circumstances, I'm sure. So one way, one thing that the tenors can do to help is to think vertically. In the second bar there, the tenors and the sopranos both have Cs. You can circle those, again, source, pitch, destination, pitch, connect it, uh, as a reminder. So the tenors will be listening for the sopranos and thinking about them as they tune. That's especially crucial for the third in that chord, which, uh, and as oddly spaced as it is, it, it takes attention. In the fourth bar there, where the tenors arrive to tum, uh, it's very difficult to tune that because it's an unaccented syllable and the darker vowel from the na that came before it. Um, so one tends to sing that under pitch. But if the tenors are aware that the altos are singing exactly the same note and that the basses are singing it an octave below, there's something right away that they can look at uh, and, and see while they're singing it. They don't have to depend upon uh, uh, remembering what to listen for, or just guessing, or thinking amorphously, I have to listen to something. You can also write, by the way, big uh, boxes that link all of those. In fact, if I were, um, in, in my case, I'd probably do that for the tomb uh, ease, um, but use whichever method works for you. Uh, this, the, so that's vertical tuning. This same section also uh, the tenors can look at some horizontal tuning. Find prominent pairs, or in this case, more than pairs uh, of pitches and link them in the same way. In this case, all those E's. Uh, oft, usually that first E will be okay, might be a little under, but you can work on that. Uh, if the first E is okay on Na, then you have a reference point for the E on Tum. Then there's that octave jump, uh, and so that can be low as well, that E, so you connect it to the tomb that was before it, and you have the dominum na tomb at the end. Uh, all of those E's can have a tendency to sag a smidgen, so link them to each other. Uh, I guess either they will all be sagging the same, or with any luck, the, just thinking about keeping them uh, high uh, will keep them all high. One other uh, element to this is the F natural in the tenors in the final bar there. Again, a small arrow can indicate that this bit, uh, that this pitch uh, needs a little more attention to tuning. It's the same idea as if you normally overshoot the note, but in this case, it's you're just tweaking the tuning. Uh, it's, you can use that same symbol for both things or you can adapt them uh, however uh, you need. Here is uh, my summary on pitch on starting pitches, on the kustos. That's, your, that's gonna be your favorite word, right? For, for, for everybody now. 
uh, different methods on tricky pitches and on tuning. The, the crucial element here, or the, the recurring theme, being find your source pitch, circle it, circle the destination, being the pitch you're struggling with, and connect them somehow. Questions? Suggestions? What, is, what do other people you, uh, do for these? Not all of these are the only ones. Some people have other, other systems that they use, um, other Absolutely. ideas, and we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you know, if you have uh, uh, an alternative idea, uh, don't, don't hesitate to let us know about that. We can, uh, uh, oh, Kathleen, for Tutti Unison, uh, uh, som, Somir, som, som, I'm not quite sure. Kathleen, maybe you can help me with the um, uh, with the rest of, with that third word. I'm not quite sure I know how to pronounce that. Uh, Gary, maybe you can see that and know uh, what Kathleen means. I don't readily. Is it in the Q and A or the chat? It is in chat. Um, I'm not showing that I can get to chat easily. Let's. I'll, find uh, I'll copy. Oh, over. there I can. Yeah. Maybe. No, I can't. I'll copy it over for you. In the meantime, David Plude is, oh, this is a great idea. Keeping a small supply of post-its in the back of the score. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, the, um, I'll mention post-its later for something else in fact, but yeah, they're, they're great for just having uh, those there and then you can use those to kind of point arrows to this is the tricky bit or this is not the tricky bit, something like that, or rather identify what, what needs attention. And from Melissa, um, I like to use triangles and slashes to mark where groups of twos or threes are in, in five, eight, and seven, eight. Do you ever do that? Also, kustos is my new favorite word. Melissa, that's a great suggestion. That was something that, that I cut for time. Uh, so I'm glad that you brought it up. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, slashes meaning for two or a triangle for three works very well. Um, uh, sometimes also for two of uh, a conducting, especially I'll use an angle. So it kind of mirrors the conductor's pattern that might work for you or to connect it visually. Uh, but yes, absolutely. That's a great method. Slashes are nice because they have two points. And so you know it's two. And, and from David, another great suggestion, my, my minuscule M and majuscule M, my lowercase and major uh, and, and, and uh, uh, uppercase M look the same. So he writes a J for major and an N for minor. Cool, I've never encountered that. That's great. Clarify those two a little bit more. That's a great idea. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, oh, and uh, Kathleen clarified for us. For 2D unison, drawing a vertical line through all the notes. A so when there's unison, when there's a oh, I see. unison, just drawing a line through all of those so that you know that you're all singing an E or you're all singing a... Yeah, so instead of circling it and making all those arcs, which can be cumbersome to look at, or instead of a big box drawing one line, that works great too. Uh, a single vertical line that long can be confused sometimes with things like bar lines, and your eye might not be drawn to it quite as quickly, but if it works for you, great. Uh, especially if, like me, you tend to use colored pencils, then that's the kind of thing that would really jump out. That's a yeah. great, that's a great, a great, a great pointer, Kathleen. Thank you for sharing that. All right, I don't see any others coming in. Um, uh, so uh, let's do another quick wiggle. Um, wiggle your fingers in the air a little bit, wiggle them up, wiggle them down, uh, roll shoulders back and hold for a couple seconds. Roll shoulders forward and hold for a couple seconds. Shrug and release. Breath in through an U shape and hiss it out. And with that, Gary, would you like to uh, move on to the next section? Everybody's getting bonus primer in, in some vocal warm up or vocal refreshers of vocal anatomy and practical terms from the last. Two. It's very appropriate, though, that we end with that there because next we'll talk about. Uh, uh oh. Mm, there we go. Uh, about phrasing. Um, this bit I'll go through pretty quickly. Legato, make it big. That's my theme for phrasing uh, and dynamics in general. Write a big old slur. If your conductor has told you that you're singing 
as meh or something like that. Make a big obnoxious slur, so obnoxious that you cover the other parts if you're so inclined. Because let's face it, tenors in this particular excerpt, the altos aren't helping you anyway, so you may as well just obliterate their line. Now, uh, linked to phrasing are gradual dynamic changes, uh, crescendos, diminuendos. Again, the themes are to make it big and you can even cover other, cover other parts. These are soprano lines in uh, the Thompson Alleluia leading into that movendo section we talked about earlier. There's a little word crash written and sometimes it works just to circle that but that might not keep it fresh in your mind for four whole bars. So I write a big crescendo symbol and I write it again on the next system if needed as a constant, constant reminder. And again, if that means it's uh, covering other parts, so be it, let them fend for themselves. Uh, in cases where you need to mark the, write in the dynamic itself, again, make it big. Conductor tells you to start the Omani Mysterio mezzo piano, the conductor is always right, and so you write a big MP there. You can even circle it, circle it obnoxiously. Like in this case with the Randall Thompson Alleluia, um, it begins triple piano, and that's hidden among all that other information. So just draw a whole lot of circles around it, and your eye will be drawn to it right away. Um, and if you want to really have some fun, Take a whole nother step. Draw big, big arrows pointing right to the thing. Now notice I didn't cover my own line, in this case I'm a soprano, uh, I didn't cover my own line with those arrows. I can still see what I need to see, but immediately I'm drawn to those arrows. I am ashamed at how often I use huge arrows in, in especially my, my orchestral scores when I'm conducting. Um, it helps, do it. Um, now sometimes with, with dynamics, but also in other things, uh, an idea related to the kustos, if you have a page break, then mark the information you're going to need before you need it. Here's an example of a famous page turn in the Thompson Alleluia. Uh, this is the soprano line. Uh, you're moving along, you're at mezzo forte, there's a big crescendo, then you turn the page and see double piano subito. Oh, the, the poor editor who probably spent hours trying to make it so that that wasn't at the page turn, uh, and yet this was still what the best they could, they could do. I pity the poor editor who had to do that. That said, there's an easy solution, just write in that double piano at the end of the previous page, solved. Uh, you don't have to worry about whether you turn the page fast enough uh, or what you may forget. And you'll be mentally ready to go when you need it to happen. Uh, or you'll be ready to go before you actually need it to happen. As for articulation, I won't say too much about the basic articulations. Um, there are two uh, methods to using articulations when your conductor says he wants you to accent something or stress it or shorten it. Uh, the standard editorial practice uh, these days is to write the articulation marking near to the note head. So if the note is at the bottom of the staff and the stem goes up, write the articulation with the note head. Uh, if the note head is on the top and the stem goes down, then write the articulation above uh, the note head in that case. Uh, that's what the editor books will tell you. But for score markings, you can break those rules. And what I suggest especially is to write them all above the staff. If you have a whole series of, of articulations you need to be aware of, putting them all in the same place or in the same uh, layer, if you will, uh, really can help to, to unite them to the eye. And I'm going to, in, to introduce you to my friend, my personal friend here, uh, this, uh, I think of it as a lowercase sans serif U. This is a symbol that I've stolen from poetry analysis. Often you'll have the slash for strong symbol and this weak for a, a weak uh, syllable. Um, and I find it incredibly helpful in singing music, uh, especially when you have that strong weak combination. Here's an example of that in use. Our friend, that tenor line with those repeated E's. 
uh, having that stress on the na is important for what's happening in the piece, and that's the accented syllable. And just remembering that that tum is light is absolutely crucial. It's also crucial to keeping it in tune, by the way. So that little friend, I don't know, it probably has a name in poetry analysis. I should have thought to look that up. If any of you know, please, please share that in, in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, so that's my friend. If, if you take anything away from this that you've probably never seen before, uh, then that'll be it. Phrasing, as has been the theme for a couple minutes here, is of course carefully linked to breathing. Here is the beginning of Talus's If Ye Love Me, the fourth piece that, that I'll bring into the play today. Um, there, uh, it's a beautiful phrase that starts the piece here. Um, what if your conductor, however, wants you to breathe? They may be wrong, but that's okay. You still have to do it. So this, for strictest accuracy, you can actually rewrite the rhythm. In this cha case, changing the quarter note that closes the word me into an eighth note and putting an eighth rest. And in the last bar there, you can change that meant syllable from a half note to a quarter note quarter rest. No conductor will ask you that part because this is followed by a rest after that. But for the sake of argument, there are ways to, to write that. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've practiced writing a quarter rest. It's kind of difficult to get in the hand, this was for me. Uh, might be easier for you. Now, that does, however, fill up a lot of information. Again, it's cumbersome to the eyes, which is what we want to avoid. So I often will just write the rests only. Don't worry about that flag on the, the tied A. You'll get that when you see your own marking of the eighth rest or the quarter rest at the end. Um, I, I've uh, often uh, given instructions to choirs, written instruction to choirs, to use that first method there, rewriting the rhythm. And I've actually had a singer or two come to me and say, I think it's easier just to write the rests. I agree. So if that works for you, uh, em em embrace that. Now that said, even having all those rests there, it implies a phrase break. It implies that those are two different phrases. If you love me phrase, keep my commandments phrase. And really it's not, musically it's not. So there are some other options. I love the curved line. In this case, I put it right between those two quarter notes so it looks like it should be an eighth rest. Uh, the curve line is one of my best friends in, 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 in breathing. Some people prefer a check mark or a tick mark. Some people prefer an apostrophe or some approximation of an apostrophe like I've drawn here. Uh, and there are all kinds of, of things. Again, use what works for you. For me, that curve line breaking the top staff is a real striking visual image. Uh, some people don't like that. It may not draw their eye to it as much, so they use the, the big apostrophe. And as a side element, I'll say, if you need to take a really big breath at the beginning of a phrase, just write a big apostrophe. Nothing works better. One that takes over your whole, uh, the top of above the staff and into the staff. It's great. I use it all the time, especially as a soloist. Um, um, it, it can be very handy. Now, this is if your conductor has requested a breath. What if your conductor has requested something that's not quite a breath? What if they've asked for a glottal stop? Between it, love me, keep my, they want you to close the glottis down here. Uh, in that case, I put a curved line in front of the text. Uh, psychologically, the glottis being kind of near the, in, in the whole throat and mouth mechanism, uh, to me, it's more closely associated with the text. So I write that glottal stop with the text. Just a little tick mark is all I need. I used to write GL there. But the, it, there's, again, it, be, it gets uh, cumbersome to the eyes. And, uh, and like, I don't think I've ever said the word cumbersome as many times in one hour as I have yet so far. What if they want you to not breathe, but to kind of phrase a little bit? If ye love me, keep my commandments. Then I like to draw this little thing that looks like a slur has come in and just dipped a little and then a slur comes out. Kind of looks like a, a child drawing a seagull flying. Uh, it works. Use it if you're so inclined. What if your conductor wants you to not breathe at all? Uh, most common response to that is just a slur. Uh, put a big slur that connects through it. 
Some people prefer a dotted slur so that it distinct, uh, makes it distinctive as being a, a slash or as a, as a uh, pause, or sorry, as not as a pause. Uh, that is not a phrasing thing, it's just a breathing, breathing thing. And some people prefer to go below the text. You put an extra line below it. Again, under the text indicates uh, continuing motion of breath and connection uh, with, with the line. So breathing connects to the text, connects to the line. Um, we're there, okay, good. We're, we're, there. we're there, we're at this, okay. this phrasing point. Again, the big ideas are to make it big, cover other parts, and use symbols rather than text where possible. Uh, what do y'all got for us and suggestions here? Well, we've, we've had a couple of interesting questions. Uh, one suggestion, uh, again, from Kathleen, uh, unaccented notes are in parentheses for her. She likes to put her unaccented notes in parentheses. That's interesting. I, I often will use a, a parentheses for a note that I can leave out if I'm going to sneak a breath there. Uh, an, another option. But yeah, I like the parentheses for unaccented. That's good. And uh, I think Steve and uh, Kathy are asking, uh, is uh, we were, when you were talking about breath, breath articulations in particular, is this the equivalent of a lift? The definition of lift is different from culture to culture, conductor to conductor. This is a great question. So a little controversial to some, too. Yeah. To some people, I'm backing up a bit here, to some people even that is a lift. Uh, to me it's not. If I'm thinking of a lift, to me it means this. Uh, it's, it's just kind of sneak a little something in. And it may be a rhythmic, <coughs> excuse me, it may be outside of rhythm. It might not be a precise uh, eighth rest. Yeah, that's a great question. It's really, really solid. Um, and uh, sometimes I know that I see um, what we call a hard lift, which is a, 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 a very, it, it looks like a quarter bar. I mean, if any, if you read medieval chant or medieval music, it, you get this, this strong vertical bar uh, mm -hmm. line uh, written in the score as a lift, um, uh, which means that the, the clear sound, clear air in between pitches. Yeah, medieval um, notation is fascinating. There are at least three different uh, notations for different lengths of rests or different types of lifts. Um, and if you know that, the, the medieval notation, yeah, go ahead and steal that. Like, in fact, this curved line is very similar to one of those. Uh, it, with them, it tends to be a straight line and it's smaller and it has other uses, but uh, yeah, yeah and, steal and, it. Uh, Melissa says, this is how I draw seagulls now, um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, ho I, I hope remember, you're not a professional artist, Melissa. Oh, you know, I, I remember, I remember my my own, you know, my own uh, choral choral methods classes years ago, uh, talking about, you know, just put a seagull on it, and um, uh, and then uh, we've got another one here. Um, I use BB for big breath, especially for a long phrase coming up. Yeah, I guess the quality of breath that you have to take is really important, isn't it? Yeah, the. Um... Um, I, I, I would encourage against BB because it, again, it's letters, and so it, it takes a while to process. Um, now, if you've trained your eyes and your brain to do that, great. But if, if I were just starting out wanting to learn a new notation for big breaths, it's not, it wouldn't be my first choice. Um, again, I go for symbols rather than letters, but I know not everybody has their brain wired like mine. Thank goodness for that. I mean, often we do see NB in a score for no breath. Um, uh, that, right. that is an editorial yeah. mark that we see something. Yeah, and, it's, uh, and again, I always see that and I want to think, nota bene, what do they want me to pay attention right. to? Right. Uh, so so there, there are many abbreviations that, that could be in play. Uh, so if, if you use that, uh, what, what was it? Um, uh, oh, wow, here we go. In William Walton's letters, sometimes oh, BB means Benjamin Britten. It took him 58 and minutes, everybody. sometimes it means Billy Budd. And sometimes it means something else. So, so you have to, we have to be careful in musicology. Yeah. All right, I, I should, I'll stop. Uh, I like the seagull, but a lift from me is an apostrophe, not a breath. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, in great, fact, great it's comment. good. Use, use whichever of these uh, symbols means something to you. You know, uh, steal one of these symbol ideas and put it to some, some other use entirely. Fantastic. Um, I encourage it. So Gary, if there aren't any other William Walton references to fit in, um, do, you, do you have any, um, do you have any other, uh, um, anything that we haven't quite gotten to yet? 
Um, I do. Uh, we, how are we on time? We can't, it's, it's we're, modular. We're, we're getting right there. Um, uh, and here's another one from Vicky. Um, uh, backwards apostrophe is a lift. It just flips the apostrophe so that it, another, <laughs> that's actually pretty clever. Um, um, and here's another great, oh, I like this one a lot, actually. And uh, how, do, how do we emphasize the onset of a consonant? So like if we have to do a hard K or a hard T to yeah. really set the text in motion. Uh, actually, text is coming up later if we, if we continue. Okay, <laughs> I think we should do that then. Okay. Let uh, us oh, go on. Some of these are actually pretty quick to care. I have some elements of structure and then of text and then we're done. All right. Um, when you're starting out, not always necessary, but if your conductor tells you what they're beating, write it down. In this case, the conductor said it's in a half note or it's in two. You can write in two if you prefer. And when you're told what pitch you're given, if you're only given one pitch, write it down. Uh, I suggest writing it down uh, by the bass line because we think of basses as being uh, fundamental, the harmonic foundation. So if the pitch is there, it's there. So in this case, for example, the Victoria, um, there are philosophies of giving an E or a B here. And likewise, conductors might conduct this in two or in four. I've, I've seen both, I've probably done both in both cases. So you can write it down at the beginning. Notice that it's big, it's in circles, and it's in an un uh, unusual location. Measure numbers. Uh, some scores include bar numbers every five or ten bars only, but then your eyes don't know where to go right away. So if you ever have to write in measure numbers, do yourself a favor, write them in at the beginning of the system, above that soprano staff. If you have to count them on your own, you can ignore pickup bars and ignore repeated measures. That's standard counting practice uh, in, in, in music. Uh, but definitely write them at the beginning. Did I say repeats? Repeats are the bane of my existence. Well, one of them. In this case, the talus, if you love me, there is a repeat on one page. You have to turn the page and then there's an, uh, the, the, the return repeat. So my suggestion for this, and it works well for all repeats, is make it big. Write it huge and obnoxious. When you see the start repeat, you, will, you can't miss it because it just covers everything, right? Uh, what that means is when you see the end repeat, you'll know immediately where to go back to. Um, you may have to admittedly write, you know, go back to page five or, or bar 12 if it's far, far back. You may have to dog ear the destination page, in fact, uh, but write it big and you'll learn it quickly. Also, you'll want to draw attention to first and second endings. I don't use anything more elaborate than, uh, than a, a huge circle there. This is especially crucial if you have a first ending that is two or three or more bars really draw attention to it. And if your conductor gives you an instruction of, to do something differently on the second time through, then I suggest uh, writing it thus. I use a little degree sign uh, because I'm European at heart. Uh, some might prefer colon. I write that, I prefer that or re recommend that above second time, E, P, uh, something like that. Um, because again, your eye will read the symbols more, more quickly. And that degree sign doesn't have any other use necessarily in music. Uh, this is a controversial suggestion, but it's an important one. I know that many singers love to highlight their text the whole score through. Um, and I, I recommend against it for a couple of reasons. It, first and most important, it discourages you from counting the rests effectively. And when you put a, a, just a, 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 a highlight underneath the rests, it, it kind of doesn't quite translate. Um, it also keeps your eye exclusively on your part and you won't notice other parts as much. So that affects ensemble and tuning. So instead, I suggest marking the beginning of your staff only. I use this kind of big carrot. In this instance, for example, if I'm an alto, I'm so used to singing the second staff down, but there's a baritone soloist on the top line. So I'd put that little marking to remind myself that I'm the third line. If that little carrot, uh, kind of angled carrot is not enough for you, Try just highlighting the beginning of the staff and see if you can train your eye to read the rest on your own. Or just highlight spots, you know, the beginning of every other measure, starting to train your brain so that you can see more of what's on the page. But marking the beginning of the staff is a, is a, is a saver, savior. 
we, uh, we had a question about consonants. My top recommendation on consonants is to learn the International Phonetic Alphabet. And you can uh, start that process through the Emerald Choral Academy session on October 12th. But if you don't want to learn the whole thing, I'm just going to include a few bits of advice uh, if, you, uh, if you're singing in another language and you're using English near equivalents. I would suggest writing a G for a hard G sound, but put a line or a slash through it for the J sound, like generatio in, 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 in Latin. Similarly, I use that slash either just above it or through the top to remind myself of a rolled or flipped R. And you can use that on a T or other, or P as well, uh, that something needs to be unaspirated, that you don't sing t all the time. Here's an example of those in use. So you don't sing me stereum et. Uh, instead, you have me stereum et uh, as, as an easy reminder. Now, since we're talking about consonants and we have consonants on the page, uh, to have a strong consonant like a K, my only suggestion is to circle it or underline it. That's what I do. I find underlining works, works sufficiently, and not just one little underline, but an obnoxious underline. Um, or sometimes you can write K uh, above it. Uh, I used to do that quite a lot, I know, though, though, though I don't anymore, but if it works for you, do it. Another trick is if, you, if the consonant needs to be early, like oh, monum, that M has to be before the beat, uh, then I circle the M and draw a little arrow to the, to the left. Um, I won't get into too much time, uh, detail next, I know we're short on time. Vowels. These are important symbols. Often a conductor will tell you for a taller vowel, what that means may vary from conductor to singer and back and forth. And I write these two strong vertical lines like the side of a jaw going ha. Ah. If they want a brighter vowel, then I do these little, these, uh, these carrots, these arrows. Ha ah, ah. ha. And if I want a darker vowel, I have these parentheses. Ha. Oh. Taller, brighter, darker. Those are usually the things that that conductors will request. And here's that same sample with all those in use. Of course, no conductor in their right mind would want it to sound home, ha, noom, but you, know, you can see how they work. Sometimes they cover the consonants, so it's good to know at least what the text is going to be first. Um, this is a case where, for example, those parentheses, um, I use them for darker vowel. I think it was Kathleen that said she'd use those for a, uh, to keep a pitch soft. Uh, you could instead use this uh, method to keep a, a, a syllable unaccented as well. That, that, that would be a good use to that. Uh, skipping quickly through translations, some people like to write the word for word translations under their text. I think that's hideous to look at and it's difficult to read. It draws your attention away from the actual sounds you need to make. So write about the be between the systems or at the bottom of the page and you can line them up or space them out uh, so that they go together with the phrases of the text. Um, trust me, you'll still be able to learn the language well enough. Um, you don't need to know exactly what every, every word may mean at every time. This also has the benefit of um, if the text repeats, you can just write it there once and no matter where you go back or start from, you'll be able to see where the text is and, and what its translation is. And this brings us to the final uh, sur summary here. Uh, the structure, again, writing things big, uh, making them obnoxious, writing them in unusual shapes and angles. Uh, there's so much more we could say about text to I recognize, uh, but I'm kind of leaving that for, for Michael with his presentation on IPA in, in a few weeks. Uh, anything else we have from, from the world? Uh, the, you know, Steve and Kathy just wanted to remind us that highlighting can be a benefit to those of us whose eyes have aged uh, to a point. And That's an excellent it, point. It, it, does help, it does help sort of draw the eye to the appropriate staff or the right staff. Uh, yeah, it has board. that strength. It, it, it has drawbacks as well, but the strength is very important. And if, and if, if you find that very helpful, then, then keep using it. Um, I, or I do try it on some sometimes. pieces and not others. See, see how it works for you, but yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've uh, also, I've, I mean, this is 
you know, I've also realized that the Vaughn Williams Mass and G score is too small for me, no matter which pair of glasses I have on. And when I'm singing the solo sections, I actually have to enlarge those parts of the score. I mean, it's a little bit non sequitur, but, um, you know, sometimes it's, the printing is tiny and the plates are old. Um, at the beginning of score, I mark T for tenor if it is in an unusual place. We're Assuming you're a tenor and singing that. Yeah. Cool, that works. Yeah, mutatis mutandis, yeah. yeah. Let's see what else do we have here. Uh, 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 oh, uh, we, got a, we, got a, we got a thumbs up, an amen brother, uh, for, for the, um, the having to increase the size of the score sometimes. Yeah. Well, with um, the one choir that I direct, we actually have one singer who uh, scans in all the scores and enlarges all of them and removes all the white space from the edge um, so that singers who, who find that helpful can use that uh, instead, and it's it's it makes a difference. Uh, the other th one of the things that happens for me occasionally, even though basses are fundamental, we don't always get included in everything. Um, and sometimes the staff is just SSA, or it's you know, or it's just the tenors, or or whatever. I have to write a slash yes. through that system on the score so that I don't accidentally come in and sing somebody else's part. That's interesting that you do it over the whole system. What what I do in that case is I'll put a big X. Um, where my part would be in the system if I were there. Ah, so tenors, yeah. I'm usually second line up, but if this bit is like S-A-B, then I'll put a huge X over like the alto line, the second up, or between the alto and bass line. I usually uh, need, a, I'm a bass, so I usually need a little more visual assistance than, you know, I need, don't sing, in order to, you know, not come in. Whereas I use the big X uh, above on the screen to signify that this system has been cut from the piece and will not be performed. Yeah. So uh, I love that different symbols mean different things to different people and we, we can all figure out uh, different systems that work for us. And for me, that's a corner to corner slash on the page. If the, if, the, if the page has been cut, it's corner to corner and I write V-Day in so that I know where I'm, where I'm, where I'm going. Uh, the other one that I wanted to um, add to the discussion is VS at the lower corner of a page if you have a yes. very, very, very fast page turn. Right. So, yeah, the, the, uh, something that instrumentalists know very well, uh, at the end of a page, they write V period, S period, which means volti subito, the Italian for turn immediately. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I've taken to VS now. I used to use TP partly because it made me smile like I needed to go shopping for toilet paper every time I needed to turn a page. Yeah, it's good to smile in rehearsal. Uh, yeah, VS is good. Um, that's another thing that got cut from the, the thing, so I'm glad it's coming up. It's a good one. It's a good yeah. one. Turn. Uh, I used to write, turn the page right away. I know somebody who writes, turn the page now, and then a certain word that I won't repeat referring to themselves. <laughs> so it's great. I leave love notes in my score to myself. I'll come back to it years later. Oh, is that what I was thinking? Who was conducting when I wrote that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't see any more comments coming up, Gary. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, not particularly, just again, those reminders that as you're creating your own uh, score markings or uh, applying them, however works for you, think about those variables of where you're writing it, how big you're writing it, what the shapes are so that it's different from what you'd see as part of the score and using symbols uh, when possible rather than letters or words, it's quicker to the brain. Uh, and again, use whatever combinations work for you. I hope you all found at least a few different things that you haven't encountered before that you'll find useful. Thank you for your time. Well, Gary, thank you. And thank you to all our participants for your questions and your contributions. We will make Gary's slide deck available as a PDF in addition to the handouts and the video. Um, on the website uh, just as soon as we can get it up, probably three or four days. And I'll email you all and let you know that that, uh, that, that has been posted. Uh, you can help create more sessions like this for the Emerald Choral Academy by donating uh, at emeraldensemble.org. And the uh, link is also in the chat. The fourth session will take place on Thursday, September 24th at 4 p.m. where Melissa Plogaman will be your instructor for survival tactics for seated rehearsals. Uh, registration is already up on the website. I think uh, many of you have actually already registered, uh, but we hope you can join us for that. And no, with that, I, I want to interject and say, please spread the word for that one. I'm really looking forward to that because it's something that I struggle with sitting there for two and a half or three hours or even standing that long 
and reminding how the breath works. I hope I'm looking forward to 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 learning from Melissa there. Absolutely, it's going to be it's going to be a great uh, uh, a great session. In the meantime, I'm Scott Kovacs. Um, thank you uh, again for being here, and thank you, Gary, for a thorough and wonderful presentation. Um, and from all of us at the Emerald Ensemble, from the staff singers and the board, uh, we wish you good physical, mental, and musical health. Thanks again for being here, everybody.